If it seems like politicians spend more time these days talking about Aunt Jemima getting taken off pancake mix and who can use what bathroom than they spend on voter suppression and raising the minimum wage, it's only because you are absolutely correct. In the last year, there's been one discussion in Congress on wa raising the minimum wage, and it only lasted two hours and seven minutes. Meanwhile, there have been 14 hours of congressional testimony on cancel culture, which doesn't include the time this idiot spent reading a children's book. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. But to be fair, Kevin McCarthy is only the second most powerful man in Congress. Now, if you're wondering how we got here, maybe I can help in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? When politicians get riled up about something seemingly small, like Dr. Seuss's family pulling his racist books from shelves, there's a name for it. It's called the culture wars. A culture war is a conflict between groups struggling for dominance of their values, beliefs, and practices. Basically, when a politician can't win by making a logical political argument, they resort to a culture war. Like, instead of coming up with a good immigration policy, they just yell about how immigrants are gonna steal your jobs. Or instead of finding a bipartisan solution to climate change, they tell you Joe Biden is gonna steal your hamburgers. Now, that's a real example. Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert tweeted it, followed by, why doesn't Joe stay out of my kitchen? And frankly, he should, because her kitchen is full of guns. She said, why doesn't Joe stay out of my kitchen? And she's right. He needs to stay out of my kitchen until he learns how to work a hot comb. If you're not old and you're not black, then don't you try to understand that joke. Here's another example. This is Rachel Levine. She waited over a month to be confirmed as Assistant Secretary of Health. Of course, there was no rush. We're only in a global pandemic. A lot of Republicans opposed Levine's nomination because, um, let's check her qualifications. Oh, she's a pediatrician. She graduated from Harvard. She served as Pennsylvania's Secretary of Health. So she's literally done the job before. Let's see, if she was confirmed, it would make her the first openly trans gender federal official in history. I found it. I found the reason. It's because they're terrible. So terrible that Kentucky Senator Rand Paul just kept repeating the words genital mutilation over and over again during Levine's confirmation hearing. Genital mutilation has been nearly universally condemned. Genital mutilation has been condemned by the WHO, the United Nations Children's Fund, the United Nations Population Fund. According to the WHO, genital mutilation is recognized internationally as a violation of human rights. Genital mutilation is considered particularly egregious because as the WHO notes, it is nearly always carried out on minors. That man is not just terrible, he's raisins in the potato salad terrible. And if that clip didn't make any sense, that's the entire purpose of a culture war. It's not supposed to make any sense. It's supposed to scare people away from wanting change. It's one of the oldest tricks in the book, not green eggs and ham. I'm talking about the book that convinces people that anti-racists are gonna turn the tables and enslave white people, or that saying black lives matter means you're anti-cop, or that gay people are gonna steal your children and raise them. Though frankly, you should be so lucky. And if you think a war on culture is some kind of exaggerated metaphor, it's not. The ideas that conservatives sling around in the culture wars are dangerous and they cost people's lives. It's not a coincidence that the, fir that the worst year for violence against transgender and gender nonconforming people was 2020, when the Trump administration reversed laws that protected transgender Americans. And it's not a coincidence that anti-Asian hate crimes rose 150% last year after the president publicly demonized Asian people. Now, this is the part of the segment where we usually reach back and find an obscure example from history, but not today. Today, we only have to reach back to 2020 when old ran genital mutilation Paul blocked a bill that would make lynching a federal crime. No one could understand why Rand Paul wouldn't want to pass a law called the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, but Paul didn't have to explain himself because he waited until everyone was distracted on the day of George Floyd's funeral. Who blocks an anti-lynching bill during a funeral? That is some next level evil. Joffrey Baranthian heard that and was like, too far. 
Okay, so here's the obscure part. In 1918, Congressman Leonidas Dyer also introduced a bill to make lynchings a federal crime, but it was defeated because, and this was the literal reason they wrote down on paper, they needed a tool to stop black men from raping white women. Can you imagine putting something that awful in writing? I won't even put gossip in a text. I put it in a voice memo. During the next year, in the red summer of 1919, Lynchings exploded. Then in the 1920s, the NAACP begged Congress to pass an anti-lynching bill. They even financed a study that proved <gasps> that black men weren't going around attacking Karens. Black men were just doing what black men in the 1920s did, minding their own dang business and making finger waves look good. But the bill failed, and so has every anti-lynching bill from the 1920s until now. To this day, there has never been a law against lynching in the United States. This law is more overdue than a woman who is 15 months pregnant. And even she would be like, forget me, just pass the bill. Now, you might be wondering if there could be a reason for this besides racism. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think there has never been a transgender person qualified to work in government in the history of this country? Do you think it's a coincidence that Congress is 77% white and that, set, that it's also 73% male? Or that 83% of the federal judiciary is white? This isn't racism, it's beyond racism. This is white supremacy. Because the purpose of a culture war is to make sure people are afraid of change. And resisting change means maintaining power. And that's why they're fighting to keep racist children's books and Confederate statues. And that's why they'd rather talk about cancel culture than domestic terrorism. Because culture wars and white supremacy go together like, well, green eggs and ham. And I do not like them, Sam, I am. This has been How Do We Get Here?